welcome to the meditation meditation class again glad to see you some of you come here quite early and sitting here and meditating it's very encouraging to see people coming here and sitting and meditating it shows that you really want to meditate you really like you really love what you are doing i'm only here to help you not really to teach you actually only if you really want to learn you learn nobody can really teach you this is a very important thing to understand so to begin today's meditation class i would like to begin it with a question a very simple question and the answer also is very simple but think for a while what is the biggest burden we are carrying just take a few minutes to think about it you know it's very important to ask the right question and also it is very important to live the question this idea to live the question is very very important only if we live the question then we will get a living answer and we have to live the answer again and only if we live the answer then we will find another very deep and meaningful question and we live the question again so living the question is the right way to find the answer so do you have a question are you living a question any kind of question but the question must come out of your life it must come out of your mind of your heart it must be a living question not just a theoretical question not just a hypothetical question it must be something very real so those who have real question and those who live the question live their life very seriously very meaningfully very deeply and after they have lived the question for a long time their life gives them the answer it's your life that gives you the answer you cannot find real answer from books or from somebody else they might give you some hints only but to see the truth of the answer you have to look into your life again the truth of the answer doesn't lie in the sentence it lies in your life So my question again what is the biggest burden you are carrying around have you asked that question to yourself if not just ask it now what is the biggest burden that i am carrying around can you guess anybody can guess the answer right that's right the biggest burden we are carrying around is i do you feel that i that's the biggest burden we are carrying around if you can just let go of that i you feel so light again that's the biggest burden that's why in meditation the first thing we learn is to see that there is only natural phenomenon mental and physical phenomenon just pure phenomenon one phenomenon is mental which is very distinct from another phenomenon which is mental or physical or material whichever was you like i'm not like sure of the correct wording so the first insight is to see that there is just phenomenon nothing permanent no entity no being no i no ego no personality just pure phenomenon and that brings tremendous relief that unburdens the mind so this i is the creation of the mind actually it creates its own burden and the first enlightenment also totally eradicate this i-ness sakaya deti the wrong view of i-ness it doesn't eradicate greed this is a very important point to notice 
the first stage of enlightenment doesn't eradicate greed, it doesn't eradicate anger even, it doesn't even eradicate uh, competition like pride, it eradicates the wrong view of I. So sometimes people say that, oh these people are meditating but look they are still very greedy. Yes, they can still be very greedy, but that greed has no backing of I. So even though they are greedy, they, they will not go and steal, they will not cheat. They will get what they want uh, properly, in a proper way, rightfully. So I'll review what I said last week if, uh, again and then continue it. So, Nama rupanam yathava dattanam diti visudhi nama. Nama rupanam. This is com combined words, compound word. Nama and rupa. So nama is a process. It's not an entity. It's not a being. It is not permanent. It is not always there. Nama is something that arises. And rupa also is not a thing. Rupa actually is a quality. So please keep this in mind. Whenever we use the word rupa, we are not talking about a thing. We are talking about a quality. Like heat is a quality, it's not a thing. Coal also the same. It's a quality, it's not a thing. It's a process. It is something going on and on continuously. It has continuity, but arising and passing away and then arising and passing away. It's a continuity. It's, that's why it is called a process. And this Nama Rupa, these two processes, they are distinct, they are not the same. So sometimes I hear about this non-duality, saying that there is no such thing as Nama or Rupa, both of them are the same. That is not true. They are not the same. They are very distinct. Nama is a kind of consciousness, knowing. Rupa is just the object without this quality of knowing. It doesn't know. Nama is that quality which knows. Rupa doesn't know anything. It is just pure material quality. So two different things, material and physical, uh, mental. And in the meditation practice, when the mind becomes very quiet and still, although sometimes a few thoughts might come and go, the mind stays on the object for a long time and it begins to <coughs> focus on one thing doesn't put things together. This not putting things together is very important. When we put things together, we get a concept. We get a pinyati. When we bo don't put things together, when we see something purely as it is, then we really see the quality. Either nama or rupa. So, when the mind becomes so still and see pure quality, then we can see that this is just pure quality, not a being, not a man, not a woman. So this is the first insight, very important. Unless we can get to this first insight, there is no hope of any progress. And also, uh, we come to see that there is this consciousness which is aware of this object. For example, a sound. So when I make a sound, this sound is pure uh, physical quality. It is a process. You can see the ringing going on and on and then it goes away. So before I make a sound, there is no awareness of, the, of this sound. So this awareness arises because of this sound. And you can see the two very clearly, very separately. And this awareness arises now. It is not already there to be aware of. It is not waiting to hear the sound. The awareness arises when the sound arises. Before the awareness of the sound, there is another awareness which is also a condition for uh, the next awareness to arise, but they are not the same. So we think that there is some sameness all the time. Something is always there. So this is the way, uh, the way we create continuity in our mind. So thought creates continuity. Thoughts create this idea of sameness. 
So when we totally stop thinking and become uh, mindful and concentrated and pay attention to what is happening right now, we see that something is arising right now. It is not there before. It is right now. So this nama rupanam yathawa dasanam. Yathawa means truly, properly, rightly, as it is. Dasana means to see. So to see nama and rupa, mental and physical phenomenon, phenomena as they are, truly, properly, rightly, is called Deti Visuddhi Nama. Deti means view, Visuddhi means purity or purification. And here this word Nama means it is called. So when we see the word in Pali, one, this word Nama, it has many meanings in different contexts. So in some cases, uh, some people translate Nama Rupa as name and form. That is a wrong translation. So I want to emphasize that here in this place, I discussed about this with Venerable Yana Vusudhi and it took us two days. We looked through many translations. So Nama doesn't mean name. Name is a concept. But Nama has another meaning which, is, which means name. Here Nama means it means. In the first sentence, in the beginning of the sentence, Nama means mental process. And in the same sentence, we have another word, the same word again, Nama. So, Nama Rupanam Yathawa Dhatanam Diti Visuddhi Nama. So the second Nama here means, it means. So, Diti Visuddhi means, Diti Visuddhi Nama, this Pali word, to translate it, it means, Diti Visuddhi means, seeing as it is, truly, properly, rightly, the process of mental and physical phenomena. So, Nama Rupa doesn't mean name and form. Name is a concept. Form or shape is also a concept. It's not reality. So, when we meditate and develop this Nama Rupa Parishida Jnana, it doesn't mean that we know the name and the form. It means that we see mental process and physical process. So, wrong translation gives us very wrong idea. It, does, it is very confusing sometimes. So, for example, we are sitting and meditating and breathing in and out. At first, we are aware of the shape of our body, the shape of our nose, and even sometimes we see or imagine the shape of the air along like a rope going in and out. Something very long. This long is something we imagine. It's not there. Where is the long air going in and out? There's no long air. But sometimes we feel like that. And slowly and slowly we overcome all this imagination of shape and name and come to the pure awareness of sensation. Something rushing in, touching, pushing. And this touching, pushing is a process. Very simple process. But even in this simple process, we have wrong view. So to purify this wrong view, we see this simple process uh, without mixing it with anything else. So we see that this is just pure sensation. No name, no shape. Just pure sensation. And then after a while, we see that there is this consciousness which is aware of this sensation. This sensation, it can be warm, it can be cold, because when we breathe in, it's a little bit cool. And when we breathe out, it's a bit warm. So this warm or cool, or pushing, touching, what either of these, we become aware of that, we are not thinking about that, and we see that there are two processes there, two very distinct processes going on. And neither of it is a being, an entity. Neither of it uh, lasts a long time. It is arising now and disappearing now. But in the beginning we don't emphasize on arising and passing away. We emphasize on just pure process. So, Ah, she'd know. 
this mental process, uh, the physical process, we call a chedana, chedana. It has no chedana. Materiality has no volition. It has no intention. For example, say, the hair doesn't know that it is on the head. And the hair doesn't want to go anywhere. Who wants to go? The mind, the consciousness. So this materiality is called achetana. It has no volition, it has no intention. Abhyakato also. And nama yathava dasana means seeing that this consciousness, it takes the object, it goes toward object, it reaches the object. We want to hear, we pay attention. This paying attention is the quality of nama. Taking the object, knowing the object. So there is something which doesn't know anything, which is physical process, and there is another process which knows the object. So the two are very different. And these two, uh, this nama arises because of the object. Without an object, there cannot be no con- any consciousness. So the consciousness is not already there. For example, when I touch like this, the sound doesn't come out of this stick. It doesn't come out of the bell even. Which means that the sound is not already there. So, depending on how hard I hit, the quality of the sound will be different. It is not already there one after another, sitting there waiting there to come out one after another. So if it's already sitting there, waiting there to come out, then no matter how hot I hit, the same sound will come out. I can have no control on that. So because it is conditioned, if I change the condition, the result will be different. So the sound is not in the stick, it is not in the bell, and it is not waiting there. It happens when the stick hits the bell. So it is ringing now. That means everything is new. So to understand it as something new is very important. The same thing with seeing also. When there is no awareness, when you keep your eyes shut, you don't see what is in front. And the moment you open your eyes, something strikes your eye, and then this awareness of seeing. Seeing consciousness arises. So it arises at this moment. So you can see the two different things, the object and the consciousness. Two distinct quality. And this is called Nama Rupa Prichidanyana. And in another case, for example, when you want to move, first the consciousness arises, the intention to move, and then the hand moves or the leg moves. So, in the case of the sound, the sound preconditions the consciousness. Because of the sound, the consciousness arises. And in the case of moving your hands or your legs, it's your your intention which preconditions the movement. So, physical process, uh, conditioning, mental process, and mental process, conditioning, physical process. Both ways, it works both ways. Therefore, when we want to eat, when we feel hungry, we want to eat, then we get the food and put it in the mouth. But who is eating really? The function of eating is done by the body, the physical process. The hand takes the food and put it in the mouth. If you don't move the hand and just sit and look at the food, and tell the food to come in, it will not come. So, the mind intends and it gives direction or instruction to the body and the body takes the food and puts it in the mouth. So, the mind intends and the body eats. So, mind and body eating. Not I eating, mind body eating. But we think that I am eating. In truth, it is mind body process eating. So if you can understand that as a process, then you have this purity of view. So the same thing, just expand that. 
When you want to drink, it's the same process. When you want to walk, it's the same thing. Like you are standing for a long time and you feel very tired, your legs become very stiff. You want to move. And the intention is coming. Move, move, move. It's, it really pushed the body. And then you decide to move, lift your, uh, your leg, and then move it forward and place it. So, mind-body moving, not being moving. So, that way of seeing is Nama Rupa Prichidanyana. So, in truth, there is no being. And there is another reality which we call the being as a truth, which is uh, Samudhi Satya. So, don't mix the two reality. In Samudhi Satya, there are beings, there are men, there are women. But when we come to Paramata Satya, when we meditate, we go beyond that and look into the qualities only. But when we meditate, we don't think about it. The important point is, before you meditate, try to think. But when you sit and meditate, don't think about Nama Rupa anymore. As you become more and more mindful, as your mind stays more and more on the process, it will appear naturally, spontaneously. And the understanding will be there very clearly. Two processes going on. Nama Rupanam Yatawa Dasananti. So, saying that understanding or seeing Nama Rupa process properly, rightly, means Ida Namam. This is Nama. This is a mental process, which means that this is not a being. This is mental process and Itika Namam. And Nama means just this. It doesn't mix with physical process. No mixing, no adding. So, normally we mix all things together and we have a very vague idea about things. Here we come to a very clear-cut seeing. This is Nama and this is just Nama. It doesn't mix with Rupa. Although they are interrelated, they are not the same. They are distinct process. Na ito benyo. Benyo means more. Ito means from this. It is nothing more than this. Nama is just Nama. It's not more than that. And idan rupam, this is physical. Heat, cold, movement, pressure, heaviness, anything. This is just physical process. Itika nupam, this much is physical. Not more than this. It has a limit. This much is physical. It doesn't mix with mental. Although it is also related with mental process. Na ito beyo, no more than that. Tita lakhana, tan lakhana mukhina. So, lakhana means the natural inherent quality. Like heat is natural, inherent quality. Its own quality. Uh, other qualities also the same. The nama, the quality of nama means it knows. So that's its quality. So this quality, seeing this quality only. Dhamma mata bhava dhakana. Dhasanam. Dhamma means nature. Mata means just. Just nature. Bhava means uh, quality. Dasana means seeing. So, just seeing the quality of nature, of its nature. Many, many different qualities. Just seeing the different qualities of nature. Atta diti mala we saw dana to. Atta means ego, self, I. And diti means view. Mala means impurity. So, impurity of seeing the process as something ego, I. Visodana means 
to clean it away, to remove the impurity. So removing the impurity of the wrong view of I, of the wrong view of soul, wrong view of being, wrong view of entity. So by removing this wrong view of uh, believing in a soul is called Diti Vito Diti Veditaba. It should be understood as Diti Vesudi. So this is what means by Diti Vito Vesudi. When a person reaches to this insight, Nama Rupa Prisida Nyana, then that state of insight is called Diti Vesudi, purity of view. So that comes with the first inside. <coughs> then the second inside is Pachya Prigaha Jnana. So Pachya means a cause. Prigaha means grasping, understanding. Kaha means taking, actually. So, this English word, grasping, has many meanings. One thing is to grasp something in your arm, in your hand, to take it very firmly. But it also means understanding. So, grasping the cause of the phenomenon, seeing, understanding the cause of the phenomenon. So, <coughs> they are related, but first we see the object as object and the consciousness as just consciousness. And then slowly, when this insight develops, it becomes mature. When it becomes mature, without thinking about it, <coughs> uh, the meditator starts seeing this. It's because of this object, this consciousness arises. And this object is the cause of this consciousness. The consciousness does not arise by itself. Nobody is creating it. It is not arising just without any reason. It is arising because it has a cause to arise. So depending on the person's uh, intellectual development or knowledge, different people see different aspects of causes and some people see more, some people see less, but it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that, is that no matter what arises, you see that it has a cause. <clears throat> so, for example, taking the sound again, this consciousness of the sound arises because of the sound, which is quite obvious. But we might think that, oh, everybody knows that. Why do we need to go and meditate to find that out? We don't need to meditate to find out that this consciousness arises because of the sound. We know it intellectually, but it is quite different. Intellectual understanding doesn't really remove this strong belief in self. We think that we hear the sound. I hear the sound. And in meditation, this I disappears. You see that this consciousness arises just now, right now, because of this sound. No eye hearing. And also, sometimes you hear, you'll come to the understanding that because of the ear, there's hearing. So hearing is a consciousness. So sound and ear, which is the eardrum, the sensitive part of the ear, sound and eardrum is the cause of hearing. So you come to understand this again. And if you go on meditating for a long time, Sometimes you come to understand that only when I pay attention, I hear the sound. Although I'm using the word I as in, in a conventional sense. No. Sometimes there are a lot of noise going around, people are talking, but when we don't pay attention, we don't hear. So we come to understand that the mind turning toward the object, paying attention, manasikara. Without manasikara, we don't hear. When we are sound asleep, Although the eardrum is still working, although there are many sounds happening around, we don't hear. 
because we are not paying attention. So this is a very obvious example. But although when we are awake, sometimes we might be reading a book, very absorbed in reading something, and somebody near us calling our name, we don't hear. Because we are not paying attention. When we get absorbed into another thing, and we, when we don't pay attention to something happening around, we don't know what's going on. We don't hear. So sound and sensitive ear and attention conditions the hearing consciousness or hearing, just hearing. The same thing with seeing also. So we think that we see, but when we develop this insight, we are looking at something and we know the consciousness. And we know that because of the object, there is this consciousness. And after a while, without thinking, it might appear to you. Because the eye is sensitive, we see. And sometimes, you know, people come and tell me that, it is so amazing, we see. Suddenly, the person found out that it is really amazing that we see. Have you ever experienced that? It is amazing, we see, we hear how, how. This is happening, this is so strange, this is so uh, marvelous, miraculous. So suddenly we feel something uh, in a new way. Suddenly we find out that seeing is happening, it is really marvelous. Why not not seeing? So one philosopher, uh, Wittgenstein I think, yes Wittgenstein, I remember that now. Have you heard about Wittgenstein? a philosopher which was a, who was a contemporary of Barton Russell and in fact he was a student of Barton Russell and he replaced Barton Russell's place, professorship. And Wittgenstein said one thing which is very deep and very meaningful. He said, why not nothing instead of something? If you really see, understand this thing, you'll be really shocked sometimes. It's so amazing that there is something. So amazing that there are flowers, there are trees, there are insects, there are animals, there are human beings, there are planets. Why not nothing? Why not nothing? Why is there something? Just that something is there is really amazing. So in the same way, a meditator begins to find out that seeing is happening and this is really amazing. The person sees this seeing as a new process, new experience. So most of the time we are going about doing things very unconsciously, like in a dream. So suddenly we wake up and see that, oh, there's seeing, and this is really amazing. So you experience seeing as something really new. It really strikes you. It hits you actually. So. I really feel happy when somebody comes and tells me like that. Oh, it's amazing. We see, we hear. And we think, why, why is that happening? How is that happening? So, Tatsewa Pana Nama Rupasa. That Nama Rupa that we talked about just a few moments ago, just uh, of that Nama Rupa, Pisya Pachya Pregahanena, seeing the cause of it. Titu adatu kinkan vitritua titan nyanam kinkan vitrana visudinama. So, titu adasu, tisu adasu means past, present, future. So, when we meditate, we pay attention to the present only. We don't pay attention to the past because it's gone, it's not there anymore. We don't pay attention to the future because it is not there. But when we understand the present properly, we understand the past and future also. So, Tisu Adasu Kenka Vitraitwa Tita Nyana Kenka Vitrana Visudi Nama. So, when we see that Nama Rupa arises because of the conditions, because there is a cause to arise, seeing this very clearly eradicates all doubts. Kenka means doubt. So, Kenkan Vitritwa. Vitra means to overcome. Overcoming doubts. So, what are the doubts that we have? We think that 
Was I born before? Am I going to be born later in the future? I, this I, thinking of this I. But when we see the Nama Rupa and the process and the causes for the Nama Rupa to arise, then we understand that as it is happening now, it happened before and it will happen in the future if there are sufficient cause to happen. If there are conditions, it will happen. If there are no conditions, no cause, then it will not happen. So, when we are asking the question that, was I before, that's the wrong question. Will I be there again? Some people ask, what happens to the Arhan when the Arhan mm, did his brain nibbana? If we are asking this question with the idea of a person, then this question is a wrong question. So, there is no, in reality, there is no such thing as I, but there is process. So, if you understand the process happening now, and the cause of the process happening now, then you understand that no matter what the story, we call it a man, a woman, a mother, a father, this and that, if we leave out all those names and concepts, and look at just the process, we find that in the past also there was Nama process, and there was Rupa process, and they arises and passes away just the way they are arising and passing away right now. So understanding the present completely eradicates doubts about past and future. So that eradicates also the doubt of who created this. Is it happening just out of the blue, just for no reason, no cause, or is there somebody who is making it? That's also a question or a doubt, that also clears away. Because we know that nobody is creating it, the natural cause and natural results, natural effect only. And depending on the person's knowledge, sometimes uh, if a person has studied this Paticca Samubhada, and this person will begin to see the reality of Paticca Samubhada. But if the person has not studied Paticca Samubhada, it doesn't matter. Because uh, the, the basic idea of Paticca Samubhada is that because of this cause, this result arises. If there were no cause, there will be no result. If the cause ceases, then the result will cease. That's Paticca Samubhada in brief. But if the person has wider knowledge, this person will understand that because of this sound and because of this ear, this uh, and because of this coming together of the sound and ear and consciousness, uh, there's a contact. You know, tada and Tota and Tota Vinyana and that conditions Phatsa, coming in contact with the object. And because of this coming in contact, Pasara, there is Vedana. There is some sort of pleasant or unpleasant feeling or sensation. And because of this pleasant or unpleasant feeling or sensation, there arises desire or aversion. Then we can see the reality of it very clearly. We may not be able to see it completely, but we, may, we will see at least part of it very clearly. So. If you have never heard of something before, will there be any, never heard of, never seen, and no expectation of seeing or hearing about something, can there be any desire for that thing? You don't even know what it is. No desire for it. So how does this desire arise? Because you heard about it, or because you, are, you have seen it. Because of coming in contact, there is Vedana. Because of Vedana, there is Tana. So depending on the person's knowledge, this person, uh, during the meditation, without thinking much, suddenly a flash of understanding comes up. Very short and brief. Sometimes even a very short Pali word, or even if you read in English, even the English word will come up, come up in your mind. But don't think too much of these thoughts. Although they are very deep and profound, if you go on thinking, then it interrupts your continuity of mindfulness, 
observe, observation. So, in between your meditation practice, these thoughts will come up again and again. Just watch these thoughts. Oh, thinking, reflecting. And these thoughts, at the, in those moments, can be very powerful and uh, it has a lot of energy, very deep, very clear, very inspiring too, that sometimes we want to talk about it. We can't stop talking about it. So when that sort of thing happens to you, it is very important to understand that because if you begin to talk about it, then you lose your mindfulness. So during the meditation process, retreat or in any other situation, if you really want to develop deeper insight, don't think about it, don't talk about it. But it is very hard to control. And we develop so clear insight and we feel so happy, so relieved, that uh, we want the same thing happen to our friends, whoever is close to us. We know that if this person understands this, he'll be really relieved. Because when you feel it, you know how relieved you feel. This burden of I, once you see Nama Rupa, once you see this, the cause of Nama Rupa arising and passing away, you feel tremendous relief. And there's a lot of joy, rapture, a lot of sadha. Then you believe in the Buddha also. Somebody told me that when he first experienced this, he felt a lot of joy, rapture in his body. And then immediately he think of the Buddha. He thought of the Buddha. Buddha was really right. He was really right. And many people, at that moment, they want to bow down and pay respect to the Buddha. Real respect, real veneration appears. True sadha appears. You don't force yourself. It happens so naturally. So one of my friends also, who is a good meditator, he was sitting and meditating, and when he developed deep inside, he said, I pay respect to the Buddha who taught this mindfulness. It's a very new way of paying respect actually, very personal. Not because of any reason, not because of any other uh, causes, just because he taught this mindfulness practice. I pay respect to the Buddha. In the text there are many different um, doubts mentioned, but not all these are necessary to go through. So the first thing is that before this life, was there I? That's one doubt. Before the, this life, wasn't there I? So this is the same question actually, from different angles. And if there was an I, how was that I? In what shape, in what form, was that a, a man or was that a woman? So it's all sorts of doubts people have. And the last uh, in the last week, I talk about one of my friends who was a woman. He is now a man. So, don't be too proud of being a man. <laughs> and don't be unhappy about being a woman even. Nobody is better actually. It's your practice, it's your understanding, it's your heart, which, is, which really counts. So, was I a woman? Was I a man? All sorts of doubts. Was I a European? Was I a, 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 an Asian? All sort of doubts. But when you understand this thing very deeply, you will see that all these names and tags are just conventions. Something happened before, because as long as there are sufficient condition, sufficient cause, they will be resolved. So will I be reborn again? All sort of doubts. Is there a soul inside, living somewhere here or here? That's also another kind of doubt. So when you look very deeply into the physical and mental process, you'll find that everything is new arising and passing away. There's no such thing as permanent entity. Everything is changing, arising and passing away. Uh, where does this I come from? Entity from one place to another. So when we use the word reborn, rebirth, it is very different from the word reincarnation. Although sometimes we use the two as, as, as if it means the same. So the two words are not the same. Reincarnation means some permanent entity taking a new body. It means that a soul is going to uh, going into another new body. 
but there is no such thing as a soul going into a new body. There is only consciousness, mental process and physical process. So in the, in the text, it explains in very, very detail, repeating the same thing, the same thing again. This, this is the two volume text on meditation, very, very detailed. So if I go through every detail, it will take quite a long time. So just try to understand this in any other context. In smelling, in tasting, in sensation on the body also, the same as sound and seeing. So I tell you about, I told you about the hearing and seeing. So take that as an example and try to understand any other process in the body and mind. And just briefly, for some people who have very deep understanding, they see that the Paticca Smopada from the beginning also. So Awija means not knowing. Not knowing what? Not knowing the truth. Not knowing the reality. So because we don't know, we think that uh, if I do this, I'll get something that will make me happy. That is not knowing. Because there is no nothing that can really make us happy. If you think about it, it's very depressing. <laughs> but we have been deceiving ourselves for too long. So just wake up and grow up. Have you ever found anything that really makes you satisfied always? Is there anything in your life that you found? We've been looking for that all the time, looking for something that will make us feel really satisfied, really happy. Have you found that? Is there anything like that? So, believing that something can make us happy and doing things in the hope that it will make us happy is a delusion. It's just a way, it is a way that. And also not understanding Four Noble Truth, which is the same actually. So I want to put things in a very simple way so that you can relate to it. Even for example, we do dana here. Every Sunday people come and offer me and every day also people are coming and offering food. It's a good thing to do. Generosity is great. We need to help each other. We need to give each other. Giving. We, need, we give money, we give food, we give clothing, we give time, we give attention. We give knowledge. Teaching is also giving. It is good to do. But what do you expect from that? That expectation is very important. If I offer this food to this Venerable Bhikkhu, then the result of that, by the result of this karma, I'll be reborn as a very rich person. That's a delusion. And I'll be very happy, I'll be very satisfied. It will bring result, but it will not really make you happy. There's no such thing like that. So even in doing dana, we are doing it with a lot of a wager that this will bring us real happiness, real satisfaction. So what do, why do we do that? In what way we do that? What do we expect when we do that? So the best thing to expect is that by the power of this generosity, may I get the opportunity to practice and understand the reality. That's the best thing you can hope for, expect. But in many stories you will hear that somebody offer a small amount of this and then he got so much, it's a good investment. So it's based on greed and I, I will get that again, a lot again, it's really good investment. So look deep into that, because if you expect so much like that, it's greed again. You are doing dhana, but it is rooted in greed, in this strong view of I. So because of that sort of view, we do something good, sometimes we do foolishly, we do something bad also. Unwholesome actions, we do that. Stealing, killing, also rooted in the belief that if we get that, we'll be happy. And also taking intoxicants, believing that that will make us happy. So either good karma or bad karma, if we don't understand deeply, we will be doing that with the belief that I will get the same result in many, uh, many fold result. So when a person meditates deeply, he or she will begin to see that. With a picture, sankara. Sankara pichaya vana ganyana. And it goes on the whole process of Pratishas Mupada. Explaining Pratishas Mupada in very detail. So it should be uh, a different class for Pratishas Mupada. Explain it very deeply.
because this Pachya Parigahanyana is talking about the cause. And Pachya Mupada is also cause and effect. It's related. Mm, here is something very interesting. Kamang Nati Vipakami. Pako Kami Navijati. Very deep, very interesting. The cause is not in the effect. And in the effect, there is no cause. It's not one in another. So, again, we pakam me in the result. Kamam, kama, which is cause, nati. Because the two are not the same. If you think that the result is in the, is in the cause, or the cause is in the result, you are taking the two as together. They are not together, they are separate. In your meaning, ubotonya. So, one is devoid of another. This is not in that, that is not in this. They are devoid of each other. Nasa kamam vina palam. But without the cause, there is no effect. It's a very beautiful gata. It's like a quiz. But very deep and meaningful. Kamcha ko upadaya tato nebatete palam. Because of the karma, the result happens. Nahita devowa bhyamawa Sansarat rasati karako There is no creator which is which creates the samsara Tubra suddha dhamma pavottanti Just pure dhamma, pure nature happening Hetu tambara pachya Because of the suitable condition so, depending on the person's in intelligence, knowledge, a lot of these things appears in the mind. It is arising because it is sufficient cause. So, in this stage of meditation, a lot of thoughts arises, naturally. Because you begin to see something, it's so true, it's so profound, that again and again, many links appears in the mind. But very important to remember not to think too much about it. Because you have developed some samadhi and some mindfulness, you can see things so clearly that uh, it makes you think very deeply, very profoundly. Very, you can get very attached to your own insight. Oh, now I see it so clearly. Oh, now I see it so clearly. It is so true. It is so true. You keep repeating things like that. And you want to think about it. And a person who has understood these two insights, it's called Chula Sotapan. Heard about that name? Chula Sotapan? Chula means minor. Sotapan means stream winner. Literally, literally translating, it is called stream winner. Uh, the real Sotapan is the person who has attained the first uh, Megapala. But this is not really Megapala, but a person who understood Nama Rupa and the cause of Nama Rupa has eradicated a lot of uh, gross wrong view of permanent entity, I, self. Because of that purity, this person is very similar to a, so, a real Sotapan. So he, this person is called Chula Sotapan, minor Sotapan. And here it's very inspiring. So, Imina Pala Nyanina Samanagato Vipatako Vipatako means uh, the meditator. Vipassana, Vipassako. Vipassana means meditating, meditation. Vipassako means the person who is meditating. So Vipassako, the meditator, Samanagato means endowed with, who has this quality, this understanding. Imina Pananyanina, with this insight. So this meditator who has this insight, Buddha Sadhani, Ladda, Ladda Sasso, Ladda Patiti. But they tore. So he has got a relief. Relief means before that he was burdened. Now he has this relief from this burden. So, Ladda sa so, Ladda Pateto. So he has some something to stand on. Some deep insight to rely on. And Nita Kadiko, this is a very interesting thing. Which means that a person who has attained this insight and who 
maintain this insight, who doesn't lose this insight, uh, has near that recall, which means this person will not reborn in a lower realm. Because how you, uh, your, your rebirth depends on the quality of your mind, the quality of your consciousness. So this deep insight has tremendous power and it gives you a kind of pure understanding, pure uh, purity of view. And because of this purity of view, the quality of mind is so high that it cannot be reborn in a lower realm. Because your life depends on your quality of mind. The two has to be to match. So uh, a lower quality of consciousness of mind gets rebirth, so to speak, in a lower, uh, lower realm, lower quality of life. So the quality of your life depends on the quality of your mind, to put it very briefly. So once you have developed a deeper insight and pure understanding, and you also have this purity of sila, purity of your mind, clear mind, purity of this insight, the quality is so high that you cannot be reborn in the lower realm. But if you lose this, if you lose your sila, you lose your samadhi, and you lose this wisdom deep insight, then it is unsure. So if you can maintain this insight, then you can feel a tremendous relief that you will not be reborn in a lower, lower realm. Sula Sota Pano Nama Hoti. And this person is called Sula Sota Pana. Minor stream winner. And once you have go through this insight, then you can really feel the relief. So one of my friends who, uh, who was a meditator, I don't know whether he's still meditating or not, he's getting very busy these days. But I hope that he's still meditating. I don't know. But once he penetrated into these two insights, he came and told me that before I meditated and before I understood this, I thought, that when I want something, I have to have it. I cannot do without it. I will not be happy without it. There's no way I can stop. I have to go for it. And this have to, to have to is a big burden. And now he said, even though now I'm still very greedy, he's a very greedy person actually. <laughs> but he said, even now, although I'm still very greedy, Whenever any greed comes in my mind, I can see that and see that as a greed. This is greed. Before that, he thought, I want this. If you identify I and this want together, it becomes a big problem. But when you don't identify with this wanting, greed, you can just see it as a process. Oh, this desire, this wanting, very strong, arising. He said, now I know that I don't have to do anything about it. At first he thought that if I don't get it, then I will not be happy. I want this and I will be happy if I get it. And I will not be happy if I don't get it. But now he said, I can just wash it. And it is tremendous relief. If you can do that much, you will eradicate 90% of your unhappiness. Really, 90% of your unhappiness will be gone. You can see the greed or desire as just greed, desire. So, without getting the back up of the strong view of I, any uh, defilement becomes weak. So, defilements become very strong whenever they get this back up of I, wrong view. I am angry, I am upset, I want to be better. So whenever that, that kind of thought appears in your mind, if you can just back away, detach, not identify, detach and watch it just as a mental process, it loses its power. So you can maintain your own uh, dignity, equanimity, and if you really need it, then you can find a good way to get it. But what we need and what we want has a big, big gap. What we want is limitless. What we really need is very little, very little. You won't believe it, how little we really need to be happy. So I told you about my teacher once. 
Maybe some of you remember. He lives in a small place. He's a very learned man, very, very learned, exceptional. So I'm very fortunate to have met quite a few teachers who are very exceptional teachers. They practice what they teach and they teach what they practice. They are not teaching from the head. They are not teaching from the books. They teach from their life. So this teacher, he lives a very, very simple life. His place is empty. Just a bare empty room. He sleeps on a piece of wooden block carved in the middle and put a towel on it and then use that as a pillow. No carpet, nothing on the floor. He will spread a piece of cloth, old rope on the floor and just lie down and sleep there. No furniture, no luxury, nothing in his place. Just bare empty room. Some people who came to see his place went up his place and found nothing. And then they said, We heard that this monk has nothing. But when we go and look into his place, then we found that this monk really has nothing. Really nothing. And he eats one meal a day, vegetarian meal mostly, but mostly a lot of rice, a little bit of tomato sauce or tomato salad, uh, green sprouts, and a very small amount of bean, boiled bean. He doesn't eat much boiled bean even and some other vegetables. Very small amount only. He doesn't eat cakes. People offer him cakes and biscuits, cookies, but he doesn't eat that. He, he said this, these are not agreeable. And eating one meal a day, and he's been doing that for more than 40 years, and very healthy. Uh, I've known him for uh, 20 years now, and he was sick only twice. And that was because of food poisoning. Somebody gave him something very disagreeable. Once I know what it was, they chopped down pork, very small pieces. The people, the person offering him the food didn't know that he didn't eat the meat. So they chopped pork into very small pieces and mixed that with vegetable and put it in his bowl. He didn't know that. So he just ate that and got a diarrhea. That was once. Another time also it was food poisoning. <laughs> he didn't get sick. Amazing. If you ask a doctor if a person can eat that simple meal once a day and stay healthy, I think 99% of the doctors will say that this person will have all kinds of malnutrition. All sort of malnutrition. But no symptoms of malnutrition. Very surprising. I can't do him like him. I'm not able to do like that. But he lives like that. He'll carry everything he possesses can be carried in a small bundle about this size. So what we want and what we need has a tremendous gap. But these days, people are increasing their want more and more, more and more, and it has become a big, big burden. So if you understand your mind, if you understand this greed, then let go, you can make your life very simple and easy. Life will not be such a big burden anymore. So actually, life uh, the burden of life is not so big. The burden of greed is bigger. So I think I should stop here today and let you ask a few questions. Tomorrow, uh, the next time, I'll go on talking about the third insight and the fourth insight. Too. And the third and the fourth are very important. But the first and two al second also are very important. They are basic. Without understanding these two, we cannot go on. So if you have any questions now, Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you keep practicing, you can maintain that. It's the practice that maintains that. And also, once you have developed that sort of insight, and you can see the uh, the effect, the importance of it, and that insight also can make your life become very peace, very simple. Because we don't have that insight, we are making our life very, very complicated. We are doing too many things unnecessary. Thinking too many things unnecessary. Seeing, hearing, eating, going here and there, thinking, reading too much. Once you develop this insight, it will make you see that there are things important in your life and there are things not important in your life. You will see the two very differently. Mostly we think, we put all the things together and think everything is important. And we get involved in so many things that we don't have enough time to do 
or to meditate even. So once we see very clearly that a lot of the things that we think important are actually not important at all. A lot of our worries, worrying about the children, worrying about the husband, worrying about wife, worrying about job, job, even worrying about old age and death. So once you develop these, this deep insight, you worry very little. Your worries become immediate problems only. When you get sick, then you need to worry about that. I should go and see a doctor. But you don't sit and think, what will happen in the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? No worry like that anymore. You do what you have to do, what you need to do. You can let go a lot. Make your life very simple. So that's, that's why I said, most meditators, real meditators, who maintain their insight, live a very simple life. They cannot live a complicated life. One of my friends, who is a good meditator, said that uh, she is really afraid of getting something new at home, bringing something new at home, some new gadget. Very afraid of that. There's a tremendous fear. It's not a, a, a neurosis, but she's very wary of it. If I get something new, that will occupy my mind. That will take my mind, my time, demand my time. So most people, when they go down into the downtown city, they see many stores full stuff with many beautiful things, useful things. Oh, I want this, I want that, I want that, I want that. No end to it. But this person said, whenever I go down the, the road and look at the stores, I thought, so much junk. Who needs these things? Who are creating this need? People are creating need and making you believe that you need it. If you don't have it, you will not be happy. You are con. So these people who understand this uh, mental process very deeply, they know that they don't need it. So you can do away with so much that your life becomes very simple and you have more time to meditate. So it is important to maintain the insight. So the only way to maintain the insight is to keep practicing. And if you can develop deeper and deeper and reach to the first stage of enlightenment, then there is no way of coming back again until we reach this first stage of enlightenment. We have to keep practicing. Yes? It is a small confusion. When you say Nama Rupa is not name and form, mm -hmm. it seems that it means name and form. I said, you see, Nama has many meanings. It's name. Yes, many meanings. Yes, yes, you are right. I, I mentioned that too. We are confusing ourselves by thinking that. Mm -hmm. So add another meaning. Yes. We, you already know that Nama means name, Rupa means form. Now add another meaning. Nama means mental process, Rupa means physical process. So use the meaning according to the context. And Nama has another meaning too, many other meanings too. So that's why I emphasize this point. It is very confusing. So once you understood that, it has many meanings and you use the right meaning for the right context, then it won't confuse you anymore. So I want to clear this confusion. Right. Yes? In brief, the first insight is to see that there is a physical process which is not a being and there is another process which is consciousness, mind, mental process. And the two are distinct. Physical process is not mental process. Mental process is not physical process. But one condition another. For example, when you hear something, the sound conditions the hearing. The ear conditions the hearing. So the sound and the ear, which is the eardrum, is rupa, physical process. And you pay attention to the sound and this hearing consciousness arises, which is nama. And another example is, when you want to move, the intention to move arises, which is a consciousness, and then your hand or your, any other part of your body moves. Even your, you close your eyes and then you open your eyes, there's the intention to close and to open. So this intention and the consciousness arising with it is Nama, and the real physical process is Rupa. And second insight is very close to it, you see that this Nama arises because of this Rupa. And this Rupa, the physical process arises because of this mental process. So the two, depending on the situation, condition each other. And seeing the condition, seeing that it arises because of some condition, is the second insight. And I have not talked about the third and fourth yet, but since you want to know, I'll 
tell you very briefly. The third insight is, so you see the first insight is anatta. Seeing nama and rupa as a process, not a being, not an entity, no soul. So it means anatta. Seeing that it arises because of uh, condition, uh, sufficient cause, causes, is also anatta. It is not created. So this is also anatta jnana. The third insight sees all, all three, anicca, dukkha and anatta. Seeing that this process arising and passing away. So only in the third process the person begins to see real anicca arising and passing away. But not really mature. The beginning, beginning to see the anicca and dukkha also. So the first and two insights are anatta. The third insight, anicca, dukkha and anatta, three, all three. And the fourth insight emphasizes more on anicca, not dukkha and anatta. Although it comes together, it emphasizes more on arising and passing away. So next week, I'll talk about the third and fourth insight. So as I repeat this, the things, I hope you will get clearer and clearer. Uh, even first and two, you cannot get by just reading. It's easy to understand when you talk about it, but it is not real insight. It's not real insight. It's knowledge. When, when you experience it, you know, because at that moment you are not thinking about it. You are really seeing very clearly. Very clear. It's really amazing how clear it is. It's really surprising also. Uh, in some cases, I I'm not really sure. In some cases, I've met a few people who I don't know really whether he has never heard about it or not because it's very difficult to say that. These days people hear a lot about Buddhism, Buddha Dharma. But a few people I know who doesn't read much, they reach the first insight. But it's very difficult to reach more, deeper. Yes, they see that the thoughts are just thoughts. There's no being there. I've, uh, I know one person like that. He... He, doesn't, he didn't go to any meditation center. But when I talk with him, the way he, he talks about it uh, makes me feel that this person has real deep insight about just process. He said, thoughts are just thoughts. It's not mine, not a being. They come and go. It's not to think about it when you're meditating. Meditating. But later on we can contemplate on it. Right, later on you can do that, yes. Yes? Please, please repeat that again. Before the first insight? Well, minor insight, according to my understanding of what you mean, uh, Buddha talk about different stages of, different types of understanding. Sutta Mayanyana, which means you understand something when you listen to somebody talking. You understand something when you read it also. That's a kind of minor insight. And chintam yanyana means when you think deeply also, you get a deeper insight. And bhavanam yanyana means real meditative insight. So there are three levels. The first two levels you can just read or listen and think. You can get minor insight. You can clear away a lot of wrong views also just by reading and thinking. That's why it is important to read, to listen and to think, to ask questions, to clear. That's why we are here, to get minor insights. So that's what I think Tony means. Listening and thinking also gives you very deep insight. There's a one stage more to go. Bhavanamayanyana. So this is the beauty of the teaching of Buddha, you see. Buddha acknowledged Suttamayanyana. Knowledge or understanding you get from reading and listening. And chintamayanyana, knowledge you get from thinking. And mostly people stop there. Especially Western philosophy stops there. But Buddha goes one step further. Bhavanamayanyana. So you can't get, you can't get, 
That's right. That's right. That's why Buddhism is practical. If you really want to understand Nama, Rupa, and Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, there's no other way to get that. The only way is to really meditate, to become really mindful. That is the profundity of the Buddhist teaching. It's okay. Just ask it. Just go ahead. If I read a lot of Buddha. Base, Samatha meditation is a basis, a very strong base. It is very good if you can develop that. And very, I don't have a problem with Samatha meditation during this time. Because I think we've got Samatha, I mean, we can protect you, you can that. Buddha talk about uh, mindfulness every day, and mindfulness is vipassana. <laughs> yes. Mindfulness, yes. And Buddha a lot of use repeatedly about vipassati, looking deeply. And he's talking the sutras about the four stages of mindfulness. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, actually, Satipatthana is Vipassana. This four foundation is four different types of objects. Actually, we cannot really, in practice, we cannot really uh, cut like this. It gets mixed because when you sit and meditate, you are meditating on breathing, it's Kaya Nupasana, and then thoughts come in. And you watch the thought, it's Sri Tanupasana. And then you feel something in your body, pleasant or unpleasant, it's Vedanupasana. Sometimes your mind becomes very calm, you see that, oh, it's calm. And that becomes another Vipassana, Dhammanupasana. When you are mindful, you know that there's mindfulness there. When you know that there's mindfulness, it's Dhammanupasana. Yes? Anu, uh, Anu, actually is a short form. Anu actually, a nu, which means repeatedly. Pasana means to see, to see it again and again. So when you, you see something just for a brief moment, you are not really sure of what you, you have seen. When you see it again and again, it becomes more and more clear. So if I have something in a cup and I covered it, and I show it only for a brief second and cover it and ask you what's in there, you may not be very sure. But if you have some time to look at it, then you know what it is. So it is keeping your mind again and again on these processes. Rupa, Vedana, Chitta, Dharma. I mean, Kaya, Vedana, Chitta, Dharma. Yes? The present and unpleasant or neutral feeling. Yes. Yes. Is that also a cause? Yes, of course, it has a cause. Without a cause, nothing can arise. So when you have a pleasant sensation, it's because, for example, the most obvious is unpleasant. If you pinch yourself, it's an unpleasant sensation. Because of this pinching, something coming in contact, it's hard, so you feel pain. So when you sit on a very soft mattress, it's very pleasant, it's another contact. Right, I talked about this before, so I'll repeat it again now briefly. With the eye, you have only neutral consciousness, uh, with an eye, neutral feeling. Taking purely for the eye consciousness, it is neutral. It has no pleasant or unpleasant. But when you interpret it as pleasant or unpleasant, it becomes another process, mental process. When you like what you see, this is not eye consciousness anymore. This liking is Another consciousness, mano vinyana, not, sak- not, not chakra vinyana. You know the word mano vinyana? I don't know how to translate that because it is not eye consciousness. When you see something, purely seeing is eye consciousness. And at that moment, you don't even know what you see. There's only pure seeing. And another step, you d- identify that, what you see. And then uh, you decide whether it's good or bad, whether you like it or not. And interpretation. interpretation. It is called manavanyana. Can you help me? 
mind consciousness so chakku sota ear kana nose and jewa jewa tang kaya body and mano mind 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 so pure thinking is mano in yana Mm-hmm. But, but the same consciousness is uh, nama. Uh, consciousness is nama. The object is rupa, which is kala. When we only see kala. The eye consciousness see only kala. It doesn't see man or woman or anything. Only kala. And then the next step happens in the mind, which interprets that. So when it interprets, it's not seeing consciousness anymore. It is, so to speak, mind consciousness. So the arising of the present and the present consciousness is again pre-conditioned on the previous... Yes, memory, previous memory, yeah. Yes, yes, Pauline. Well, it's just related to um, the design and the virtue when it comes to the pre-conditioned. Yes, because of your past experience, when you see something, you know what you see, and you because you like it before, you like it now. But if you see something totally new, and you don't know what it is, you don't have lacking or not lacking, you are just thinking, what is it? So it's past conditioning. For example, in Burma, a lot of people like this fish sauce, fish paste. It's ground, fish ground, like paste, like a flower, very sticky. And it's very, very smelly. But people like that very much. And I hate that very much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's conditioning. Yes? I mean, pure here I means when you see something, this seeing itself is uh, not mixed with anything. Not with memory, then it is pure seeing consciousness. It has no liking or disliking. Only the memory, which comes with a thought, uh, makes this happen, liking or not liking. Yes, you know this is that, yes. So when you see something and you like it, it, it is because of your past conditioning. When you see something which you don't know what, then you only have this consciousness, what is it? You have no decision whether you like it or not. So liking and not liking is conditioned. And we can decondition that too. So, for example, you've been here for many, many years and... Uh, before you came here, uh, there are many things here which you don't, did not have experience of. Now that you are here for a long time, you are used to eating or seeing or hearing so many things. Now you like it. Before you don't know whether you like it or not. Sometimes we eat something and we are not really sure whether we like it or not. But if we eat it again and again, slowly we acquire the taste and we begin to like it. For example, before I came here, I didn't... Uh, have any taste of uh, soy milk and now I begin to drink small amount of soy milk and, and beginning to acquire the taste and beginning to like it developing greed now <laughs> neutral yes in, um, in a statement of insight does the strength of one insight Condition whether the next insight will arrive. That is a very good in- question. Mm. Without developing sufficient intensity of the first insight, you cannot go to another insight. Actually, one insight leads to another when it is ready. When it is sufficiently developed and strong enough, it leads to another insight. But we cannot voluntarily go into another insight. We cannot do that. It will happen. So that is a very good question. Thank you very much for that.
So don't be in a hurry. Stay where you are and develop deep enough. You cannot push yourself too hard.